Good evening and welcome to our worship service this Good Friday. The service is all about receiving. Uh, one of the foundations of faith is that we receive the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness of God. We can't pay for it, we can't earn it, we don't merit it. It comes to us as a gift. And for God the Father to give his Son, and for God the Son to give his life, the only way for us in any way to to understand that or take it in is to receive. So in the service we'll have songs together, there'll be some poetry, there will be opportunity for reflection, all to open our souls so that we may receive what Jesus has completed for us. When he died on the cross, he said it is finished. Not to say it's now possible that some of you might be saved, but it's completed, your salvation. And all we need to do is receive this holy, loving, life-changing gift. So welcome those of us who are here, those who are watching online. We begin with words from Isaiah 53 to bless us. So would you rise in body or spirit? Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen.
few times in the service you'll be invited to reflect on what happened on this Good Friday, and we're directed now to this, which if you were here this week, you know as the eighth station of the cross where Jesus dies. Listen to these words from John 19. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And, as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. We receive humbly and with tears this sacrifice of Jesus. His cross has forgiven us, made us right with God, and set us free from guilt and shame. But also, we are set free for carrying our own cross. Meditate silently for a moment on this poem by Adrian Plass entitled, It is Finished. Lord, you said on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. Finished? Is it? I don't think so. Not until the funny little woman on the Friday bus means more to me than I do to myself. Not until I read or write the message of your pain-filled eyes that I must take the ones you loved and left behind to live with me as my responsibility. Not until I freely place my stock of cherished certainties like sad, surrendered weapons at your injured feet. Not until the public and the private faces of my troubled Christianity can meet and know they recognized each other when they met. 
not until I know the names of more than half the people in my street. Finished? No, I don't think so. Not yet. Let us sing together.
Jan Deepser will read a poem now by Christina Rossetti entitled Good Friday. Am I a stone and not a sheep that I can stand, O Christ, beneath thy cross? To number drop by drop thy blood's slow loss and not yet weep? Not so those women loved who with exceeding grief lamented thee. Not so fallen Peter weeping bitterly. Not so the thief was moved. Not so the sun and moon which hid their faces in a starless sky. A horror of great darkness at broad noon. I, only I. Yet Give not or but seek thy sheep. True shepherd of the flock, greater than Moses, turn and look once more and smile a rock. We have been listening to Peter's story this season. In 1 Peter, he writes a letter as an old follower of Jesus. His words in this reading tell us why Good Friday matters. Jesus took our place and atoned for our sins. 1 Peter 2, 20, verse 20 through 25. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. For this he recalled because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threat. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sin in, this body, in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you, you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter wasn't there when Jesus was crucified. After he denied his Savior, he went out and wept bitterly. We know from the Gospels. 
And once the trial was over, Peter didn't see the rest. He didn't see the mocking, the torture, and then the crucifixion. Peter wasn't there. But Jesus died on the cross for him. Peter didn't pronounce judgment. He didn't pound the nails in Jesus' hand. He didn't mock him or place a crown of thorns on his head or lift him up on the cross. But Jesus died because of him, because of his sin against Jesus. So even though Peter wasn't there, Peter takes to heart that the crucifixion of Jesus means that Jesus died because of him and for him. He himself bore our sin, he writes, quoting an old revelation, an old prophecy from Isaiah 53. It really happened. The historical testimony is accepted as true. Pontius Pilate unjustly sentenced Jesus of Nazareth to death by crucifixion sometime around 30 A.D. That's around 2,000 years ago. But we gather each Good Friday to confess together the same thing Peter confessed, that Jesus died because of us and for us, each one of us. The same words Peter wrote, quoting the prophecy of Isaiah written before Jesus and the promise of his coming are as true today in the 21st century as they were true for the people in the first century. But how can that be? How can it be that what Jesus did long ago and far away does something to you and me today in our lives? How can that be in the words of the Belgian Confession that he presented himself in our name before his father to appease his father's wrath with full satisfaction by offering himself on the tree of the cross and pouring out his precious blood for the cleansing of our sins as the prophet had predicted. How can the loving, merciful, sacrificial, righteous act of Jesus save us? Forgive our unrighteousness and make us forever right with God. Receiving the revelation of Bible passages like Isaiah 53 and Peter's words here in his first epistle help us experience this grace. The sacrifice of God's Son on the cross is called substitutionary atonement. The Reformed understanding of this highlights that not only did Jesus suffer for us, he was punished for our sins. This is what Peter wants us to remember. This is our salvation. That Jesus bore the punishment we deserved. The wages of sin is death. Not only our mortal physical lives, but our spiritual lives. There's death there. A separation from God. And our deserving of the punishment of hell. But as our substance, He atoned for our sin. And you can think of atonement, what it means by breaking that word up into at and one. At one meant brought together again. The two back to being one. Atonement means to satisfy the demands of justice, to make amends for sin, so that the offender and the offended are reconciled again. The triune God is the offended one, just and holy and the giver of anything and all that is good. Well, what do you do to hurt someone who has everything? You give them back something broken. And that's what we did. We broke creation. Humanity has broken all that is good. We have offended God by loving ourselves more than God's righteousness. We choose more often than not to live for ourselves rather than the glory of God. Jesus satisfied God's demands for justice by perfect obedience all the way to the cross. 
He suffers our penalty. He pays the spiritual debt we cannot pay. Jesus took our place. And that sacrifice covers it all. Christ's atonement doesn't mean punishment is avoided, but that it is endured, absorbed. He takes it for us. And this is not to say that the Father was angry at sinful human beings or that he took it out on his Son so that Jesus changes the Father's mind by his sacrifice. No. The Father gave his one and only Son because God so loved the world. God's will is to see the people of the Lord repent. Be thankful. Do justice and love mercy while living in union with Christ Jesus. A full belonging now. Comforted in the Lord. In Neil planning a summary of our creeds and confessions, a place to stand, he writes, what truly satisfies the Lord is a right turn of heart in God's children. And so Peter writes, he himself bore our sin in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. So the cross, above all, is a testimony to the mercy and steadfast love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we become now that gospel. But can you imagine how this works? How could he take your place? Well, Jesus was one of us. He became human. He himself bore our sins in his body, says the Bible verses here. He shared our humanity. Yet not only was he without sin, he was perfectly obedient to God's will, completing that will to satisfy the demands of justice and paying the wages of sin by laying down his life. And he wanted to do this for you. I lay down my life, my own accord, he said, out of loving obedience to the Father and loving mercy for you and me. So he can stand in for our failures and rebellion. He was also God. God with us. So he was able to take on all human failing in his divine transcendent being. So is it right that he can be our substitute and take responsibility for us completely? Well, we know about substitutes and we rely on them all the time. Have you ever had a substitute teacher? Yes, and very much so. The information that the substitute teacher brings is just as valid as any from any other teacher. Or maybe for health reasons, you had to learn to find a substitute for meat, and you eat tofu now. Well, maybe that's not a great example, but but it's a substitute, and it brings health. And there are human experiences that witness to this hope and grace to us. Adopted children are blessed with the love of adopted parents. And there are Ukrainian refugees in Poland right now, some almost for two years, living in houses not their own, welcomed into new families not their own. And there are donors who give their blood, or even an organ for another's health. None of these are perfect examples of substitutes, especially the tofu, but all are real. And in difficult situations, to be a substitute shows great love and devotion. And it brings life-changing grace. These each point, however dimly, to the reality that Jesus fulfills perfectly both God and human, 
our perfect substitute, the sinless one, atones for our sin. He takes the punishment that our sin demanded and that we could not take. By his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, his alone, his wounds, not ours. The worst, the worst cannot take God away from you. Nothing can separate you from his love. So by his wounds, we are healed. Made whole, brought into full and healthy life with God. Able to bear our own crosses for Christ's glory. We are healed, made whole. Not that we won't face sickness or pain or tears or loss, for we are mortal. But that none of these can take away what life is for or the joy of what God gives. For our wholeness is in Him and nothing else can take that away. Now, we don't wish suffering on anybody, but this atoning work of Christ gives us the hope and strength to face the suffering that comes our way, ours and the suffering of others. So Peter ends saying, be the gospel yourself. Become the gospel. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So you can take this thing before you, this heavy thing, this hard thing, this unfair thing, this thing you should not have to, you can take it up also, for he is with you. And we meet the Lord there at all these crosses of suffering and sacrifice. It is there that Jesus lives for us and with us and through us. I think of first responders. And when everyone else is running away from trouble, they run to it. Probably the best substitutes out there. And now that can be us. As people of the cross, that's us now. Our Good Friday prayer is by Ted Loader. Holy, righteous, suffering one, shock and save us with the terrible goodness of this Friday and drive us deep into our longing for your kingdom until we seek it first. Not first for ourselves, but first for the hungry and the sick and the poor of your children, for prisoners of conscience around the world, for those we have wasted with our racism and sexism and ageism and nationalism and religionism, for those around this broken and rebellious earth and in this city who this Friday know far more of terror than of goodness that in our seeking first your kingdom, for them as well as ourselves, all these things may be ours as well. Things like a coat and courage and something like comfort, a few lilies in the field, the sight of birds soaring on the wind, a song in the night and gladness of heart, the sense of your presence, And the realization of your promise that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us or those we love from your love and the crucified one who is our Lord and in whose name and spirit we pray. Amen. Let's rise to sing.
I direct your attention this way to station nine of the cross, which is uh, Jesus' body taken down to be buried. And after the service, if you would like, you can take some time to, to come and see the stations. And the uh, last station, his tomb is over there in the cry room. And you could uh, check that out too if you would like. From Mark 15. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. And when he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of a rock. Then he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. There wasn't much else Joseph could do. 
We suppose he had hoped to stop this miscarriage of justice. He was a member of the Jewish council, so he had some say in the final vote about Jesus, but it wasn't enough. And Jesus was condemned and crucified. Out of his failure, he asks to take responsibility for the body of Jesus. That in itself is a risky act. From now on, he would be identified with the crucified one. Also, taking the body would make him ceremonially unclean for the upcoming religious observances. He would be absent, and his fellow council members wouldn't ignore that either. But he meets with his Savior at the cross. He shares in the death of Christ with his own little death. He even shares his tomb, his final resting place, his own last death. Sharing in the death of Christ, his simple though difficult devotion will make way for many to share in Christ's resurrection. I invite the deacons to lead us now in our offering. back to God's ministry tonight and now and his family. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to die on the cross. Somber night, we know. We pray for the new ministry that they need, the publications and the movies and the videos movies and language are there to prepare them. In your name,
on the Greek roof had one two hundred yards, but I saw that the two had ruined the day. It was about the ninth hour as he surrounded the bed, and his face was a fading pallor of death and anger. Who then was not afraid, targeting his foot and eye, struck as with thorns by Godhead in human agony. For him who with a cry could shatter if he willed the sea, the earth, and the sky, and them he filled. Who choose to amid tumult of the lowering sky a chivalry more difficult as man to die? What answering need of love can finite flesh return that is not all unworthy of the friend I mourn? Let's rise and body your spirit to go in the reality of the cross and the mercy of Christ. From Romans 5, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more? Did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, 
how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Amen. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his grace. Go in peace.